on one side, the genetic resource, like the, the fruit, and you have a, a draw showing a hand uh, containing some, uh, some fruits. And this hand uh, illustrates uh, uh, what I've mentioned earlier, the ATK, meaning the Associated Traditional Knowledge, uh, that is also shared uh, to, to build new value chains. Then after the, the step one, you have the second step, uh, which is illustrated by uh, a chemical device uh, with a drop of uh, a liquid. And this step illustrates the first transformation that occur in a value chain from the resource to what is called a, a derivative or an ingredient. And this ingredient, uh, correspond to the first step of the valorization of the natural resource, of the genetic resource or the uh, associated traditional knowledge. This step then uh, is aimed to reach markets, to reach national markets, regional markets or international markets. To reach those markets, uh, there is a notion of uh, scale and the what we call the primary transformators uh, usually produce at industrial scale the uh, derivative, the ingredient. And this is represented uh, with the drums uh, close to the number three. Those drums are then traveling to uh, another uh, stakeholder, uh, which most of the time is called a formulator. And this formulator or brand uh, use this ingredient at a large scale to create a formula uh, like a recipe using a recipe to create a formula that will become a consumer product. And you have an, uh, above the, the number number four, uh, some illustrations of uh, forms that can take a, a consumer product. You have a small lipstick. You have uh, some creams, uh, you can have lotions, but you can have also uh, some food product uh, that uh, can be found at this stage or any um, pills or medicines. So you, you have really a, a number, a, a huge number of consumer products today that are formulated based on a combination and recipe containing different ingredients sourced coming from natural resources. And I would like to take the time here because that's quite strategic uh, in our discussion. I would like to take the time to go back to the red arrow that you see uh, between step number one and step number two. Um, most of the time in uh, developing countries and providing countries, uh, you have uh, the export step, which occurs between stage number one and stage number two. Uh, and uh, today, uh, using some uh, tools and uh, some uh, various, um, I would say, uh, initiatives like the Biotrade initiatives or the, the ABS of the Nagoya Protocol, uh, we are using those tools uh, to uh, recapture some value uh, within the country of origin where the resource uh, is uh, occurring. And the reason for that, uh, there are many reasons actually for that, but the, the main reason for that is that through recapturing the value within the country of origin, it allows many positive impacts, social, social economical impacts, 
to uh, uh, contribute to alleviate the poverty in the country, uh, but also uh, to, to bring uh, more value in the country uh, and to uh, support uh, different uh, development policies within the country, uh, to increase, uh, for example, the autonomy of the country in some uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, industries, uh, like the, the, the health industry. Um, I mean, th there are, and we can discuss about that, there are many advantages in uh, undertaking uh, the step of uh, building what is required within the country of origin to uh, get the ingredient uh, being uh, made, being developed, then produced in the country of origin of the genetic resource or the uh, associated traditional knowledge. And uh, uh, I don't manage to move. Yeah, uh, this is what is illustrated here. Um, programs uh, using, for example, uh, the biotrade principles and criteria are supporting the investment, the, the partnerships required to go from uh, having exports being made between stage number one and stage number two to exports being made between stage number three and stage number four. And uh, in some few cases occurring uh, today, you even have in some developing countries for some value chains, uh, exports occurring at stage number four where all the values have been added within the country of origin. So I have focused also uh, my uh, contribution today to the uh, pharmaceutical industry, the, the health tech sector, because uh, you know, uh, we face extraordinary crisis, sanitary crisis that uh, has highlighted a number of uh, very important points regarding uh, the importance of the biodiversity, uh, the importance of its conservation, and uh, particularly referring to recent uh, reports released by the IPBS, um, we know for a fact that, for example, uh, the, the biodiversity loss uh, one of the main reasons uh, is what is called the entropic pressure, and the entropic pressure refers to how uh, uh, the activities uh, humans are conducting are uh, actually generating the, the loss of the biodiversity. And uh, this being said, uh, there has been also uh, the conscience uh, within every country in the world of the importance of uh, having a, a robust health system and access uh, to uh, medicine. And we often forget um, how it is important to uh, uh, know that uh, most of modern medicines are coming from biodiversity and from the research that have been done on biodiversity. So as an illustration, I have uh, put some numbers that I have retrieved from uh, reports from uh, IPBS. And uh, you have, for example, uh, between 60 and 80% of antibiotic and anti-cancer drugs come directly from biodiversity. So this is enormous. And today in the world, uh, we are more or less 4 billion people uh, depending on natural medicines. And uh, therefore, uh, we can state that biodiversity is a public health tool. And this being said, uh, I would like also to make the link uh, with the, the need uh, to support this paradigm, paradigm shift uh, within the industry and uh, to support the, the, the change in the entropic pressure that uh, we are responsible for. And uh, today, after those past months of the sanitary crisis, 
uh, we can see a change in the consumer behavior. And uh, we, see, we see that there is a demand for more uh, ethical practices and for uh, environmental friendly uh, product, consumer products. But consumers uh, are not satisfied by just words. They want proofs. They want when they buy, they want to be sure that uh, there is no greenwashing. Uh, this word is a very strong word uh, that is not uh, per se politically correct, but uh, that's really uh, today a very growing trend uh, of growing evolution uh, within the particularly the, the young generation. Uh, when they buy something, they want to be sure that when there is a claim related to um, ethical product or uh, environmental friendly pr product, it is true. And I'm uh, putting the emphasis on this aspect because this is directly linked to um, mainstreaming and applying the biotrade principles and criteria when building a new value chain. Because uh, those principles and criteria are, e are extremely important to ensure uh, throughout the value chain that at the beginning, the relationship between the primary processor and the resource respect a number of, of uh, extremely important um, uh, uh, attitudes. For example, uh, with regards to the sustainable use of the biodiversity, uh, all value chain being uh, biotrade compliant, if I can speak so, uh, must have a, a resource management plan. It's extremely important to ensure that when we use a resource, it does not destroy the resource, or it, it will not destroy or, or decrease uh, too much the resource. And uh, in the 2020 version of the principles and criteria, there is even now the consideration that it could contribute to the restoration of the ecosystem of the local biodiversity where the resource comes from. So it's extremely important to substantiate, to justify throughout the value chain that the resource is sustain sustainably managed. That's the first point. The second point is that the, the people rights are respected locally and that the workers are paid um, uh, sufficiently, that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not outrageous and uh, it, it fight against poor practices that has been seen for many years uh, in the industry. And these, the final consumers are extremely attentive to ensure that the product they buy and that um, that claim that they respect the, the people rights are actually doing it and in a very transparent way. Uh, so that's the two main points. And the, the third uh, that I would like to add also is that uh, the primary uh, transformer has, uh, is empowered, is empowered sufficiently to uh, have the, the, the freedom to create what is called a resilience, a business resilience at its level. So when uh, he or she wants to access any market, she or he has sufficient knowledge about the market to actually properly enter into the market. And this is extremely important today, uh, more than ever, because it contributes to add the value locally. So uh, you will get access to those slides. So I'm not reading uh, all the points, but uh, don't hesitate if you have any question to uh, keep your question for, for the end of this uh, intervention. So a few very important points that uh, I would like to reiterate. Um, the, the health security aspect of uh, uh, the biodiversity and uh, the importance uh, to support uh, the conservation, sustainable use, and um, 
fair and equitable sharing of the benefits that results from the utilization of the, the biodiversity. This is the three uh, big principles of the convention on the biolog bio biological diversity, sorry. And uh, this is extremely important and directly linked to uh, using or mainstreaming uh, the, the bio threat principles in criteria when accessing uh, the resource in the local biodiversity. And this is extremely interesting for a country to consider that uh, to uh, improve our work on the health security at national level, uh, to look at uh, the local biodiversity or the associated traditional knowledge um, and to properly build a value chain out of the genetic resource or the ATK can contribute uh, to the health, to improving the health security in the country. Also, it's uh, interesting and somehow important to consider that when uh, valorizing the biodiversity and the traditional knowledge, uh, it allows uh, an economic uh, diversification within the country. Uh, and this is also quite important to uh, little by little support the, the, the impact wanted by the development policies within the country. So, sorry, um, I have uh, made a mistake uh, on my slide, but I, I will correct it uh, when, uh, when I share it with the team. And it is also interesting to consider that the, the collectors, harvesters, primary processors that are in the country are uh, the actors of the change, the, the first actors of the change. And it's very important to support uh, what they are doing because they are really uh, those who are taking the, the highest risk um, because all the investment when building a value chain are to be made before you can even uh, uh, hope for a return on investment. Uh, you all know that. And those actors are actually uh, often working many years uh, before being able or in the position to simply uh, sell something from uh, their work. So it's also a strategic for a country to support uh, this part of the value chain and these investments, these efforts, because at the end, like uh, I mentioned it uh, previously, it supports a number of very interesting strategic and even critical points uh, for, the, for the country. And this is it. So I'm waiting for your question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Veronique, uh, for this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, if there is any uh, question, please uh, raise your hand or send on the chat uh, any uh, question to uh, uh, Veronique. Yes, if you can speak directly and ask your question or send it on uh, the chat. Um, <laughs> yes, Dina, please go ahead. Um, الأول أنا عايز أعرف إزاي يعني هل فعلا ممكن تكون شركات الأدوية أو الشركات المعنية بصناعة الدواء؟ Companies or anyone who is manufacturing drugs are they one of the reasons of scarcity of resources and what kind of animal or plant resources that are facing scarcity now because of the pharmaceutical industry? The second question: How can we commit to biodiversity and bio trade? How does does how do both of them maintain Maintain uh, or guarantee the independence of the uh, state. Thank you. Uh, so sorry, could you repeat, please, the first question because I was not using the the translation. Um, oh. My first question about pharmaceutical companies. Uh, okay. 
are they one of the main reasons uh, to have scarcity of uh, resources? What uh, plant and animal resources that are facing scarcity now because of uh, the usage of pharmaceutical companies? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no, I have decided to, to give my focus on the pharmaceutical companies because um, uh, we are all shocked by the, the sanitary crisis. And I think in every country in the world and uh, each of us, uh, we all felt that uh, it's so important to have a reliable and robust health system and to have efficient medicines. And um, we often, and, and this is something I have learned uh, with working um, in different African countries, um, lots of uh, people in the world are relying on the, the natural resources and the, the traditional knowledge to actually cure themselves or even prevent to, to, to be sick. And uh, I found extremely important to uh, illustrate that uh, what is considered uh, the modern um, medicine uh, is most of, of the time indeed based on traditional knowledge and on natural resources. So I thought it was uh, just a humble way to reposition uh, the, 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 the pharmaceutical industry. The second reason uh, is that uh, even if I have not mentioned it specifically, I kept on referring to the uh, Nagoya protocol on ABS uh, during my presentation. So I don't know if you are familiar with this um, uh, legal framework, uh, but the Nagoya protocol on ABS is uh, the third principle of the, the CBD, of the, the um, uh, sorry, um, sorry, the, the word skips my mind. Um, Convention on Biological... Merci, <laughs> merci, Julien. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, so it's, um, uh, it's uh, really this uh, Nagia protocol on ABS. Sorry, I don't know. There, there is an echo. I don't know. Okay. Um, and uh, no, the it's okay. It's okay. Okay. One of the one of the reasons uh, to uh, to refer uh, to the Nagoya Protocol on ABS, uh, it's because it's extremely important uh, as a, a legal tool for uh, um, genetic resources and particularly associated traditional knowledge to use this um, uh, legal tool uh, to protect uh, their interests. Uh, because the pharmaceutical industry, uh, when there is this ABS legal framework in a country, uh, is not allowed, uh, legally speaking, any longer to come in a country, collect either a resource or the traditional knowledge, and then develop uh, for example, a medicine out of the of it without having entered into the, the, the permit system, the whole process of being compliant with the ABS system. And this legal tool is extremely important and interesting for a country uh, because it allows uh, entering into developing a new value chain, which is based on the uh, share uh, uh, equitable and fair sharing of the benefits that will result from the uh, commercial use of the, the traditional knowledge or the genetic resource. And this is particularly important in the pharmaceutical industry because sometimes um, some uh, uh, profit uh, that are made out of a traditional knowledge of a medicine made out of a traditional knowledge or genetic resource can be very high for a pharmaceutical company. And with, with this legal framework, uh, the, the benefits that can be shared with a country can be used not only to support the conservation of the resource, but also to support the local uh, social economical impact uh, so that helps uh, alleviating poverty. So it's also a second uh, reason why I focused on the pharmaceutical industry. But now to really answer to your question, 
today the industry that really is, um, uh, I would say, uh, um, controversial with regards to its impact on the, the biodiversity and how it contributes to the biodiversity loss, it's the food industry. The food industry, because um, uh, most of the time uh, in uh, countries, uh, you have a competition for the land use. And uh, like I was saying, uh, locally, you often uh, face lots of poverty and the local uh, population uh, need to get a revenue. And uh, because of the increased demand of some big commodities uh, like soy, like palm oil uh, or others, uh, you see that uh, local people uh, are often uh, asked to um, plant uh, those commodities on their lands. And this is detrimental to the local biodiversity instead of valorizing the local biodiversity and finding a revenue out of the local biodiversity, they go because it takes time, money, effort, and, and lots, lots, lots of things like I have uh, briefly explained in my presentation. They go to what uh, creates um, fast cash because this is the reality in the field. They need to, uh, to put food on the table for, for them, for their children. And so they go for uh, cash crops, what we call the cash crops. Um, and this is what creates uh, lots of the time the, the, the biodiversity loss in, in an area. That was for the, sorry, a long answer for your first question. Um, for your second question, I'm not sure I understand it properly. Uh, but today, uh, to really ensure uh, if I uh, understood it properly, if uh, what you want is to, to know how uh, we can commit uh, to uh, the, uh, what we say, basically, what we claim uh, when we claim uh, good practices. Am I understanding right your question? Nina? My question is, while committed, uh, oh, so I'll start over. You have said that uh, committing to biodiversity would ensure countries' autonomy. So I want to uh, know what is the relationship, how the biodiversity would serve uh, the autonomy of countries? Over. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I missed, sorry, I missed understood your question. Um, actually, this point uh, is uh, very important and was raised to me many times uh, in different countries where I'm working today. Uh, the fact is that uh, in lots of countries, medicines, for example, or some uh, strategic foods are simply imported. And they are imported, uh, whereas uh, they they could be developed or found or produced in, the con in their country because for many reasons. Uh, I, I, well, you, you have seen that during my presentation, I have not given uh, uh, very concrete names and examples because uh, when speaking about biotrade, we speak about economical interest. And I believe that it's important to respect a, a level of confidentiality. So I won't mention any names, any country names, etc. But what I can tell you is that, for example, um, uh, during the, 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 the last years uh, in one of the countries I'm working with, uh, there were um, really uh, desperate in the pharmaceutical industry because uh, they wanted to produce a specific pill using a specific recipe within which there, were, there was a, a raw material, an ingredient, uh, that like thyme, uh, thyme extract, uh, that could be produced in their country. But they were not allowed to use the thyme extract that was currently produced in their country because uh, there were no ways 
to actually uh, get the proper analytical results that would allow them to then use this extract within their recipe. And their recipe, their medicine uh, is important to uh, cure, uh, uh, I think it was um, uh, nausea. Uh, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the treatment, but it was to, to cure uh, nausea, so quite a common uh, disease. And uh, during the pandemic, because of the, the problem of procurement, they could not import the time extract. So they were forced to stop their production because they were not legally allowed to use the time extract that was produced in their country. So by supporting, uh, creating, developing value chains, uh, uh, valorizing the local biodiversity with all the analytical capacities and regulatory frameworks that are required to actually place a new ingredient on the market. In this country, even without any import possible for whatever reason, they would have been able to keep their autonomy on producing this specific medicine. Do, do you see what I mean? Dina? I think yes. You answered the question. Okay. Uh, I have uh, uh, another uh, question uh, on the chat. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will read it for you. Can uh, we uh, bet on the private sector uh, and the investors who are always for profitability to preserve the environment and work on preserving and conserving the ecosystems, the green ecosystems, particularly in African countries, which are lacking enforcement when it comes to this. This is the question of Mr. Ahmed. This is the question that has been raised by Mr. Ahmed. Did you get it? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and this question is quite strategic and very important because uh, when I was mentioning the need for a paradigm shift, well, I was, I, I'm not the one, it's in, an international um, uh, uh, consideration. I mean, uh, it's, it's an evidence that uh, uh, the, the private sector, the international private sector needs to change its practices. Um, it's not because a company is for profit, profitability that uh, it's antinomic or it, it, it is against um, uh, contributing to conservation and sustainable use and also the, the fa fair and equitable sharing of benefits. Um, actually, in the industry, what drives the industry, it's always the final consumer. Always. I mean, uh, when, when you go back to uh, the, the illustration of a value chain, the, the last step, the last segment of the value chain are, that's where you can find the, fin the consumer product. And uh, especially within the past uh, couple of few years, uh, we've seen uh, growing the demand, particularly in the young generations, for products uh, that are uh, really um, uh, not only good as a product, so efficient, but when they are made from a biodiversity based ingredient uh, products uh, that are uh, respecting uh, the environment, the people in the country of origin. And so this growing demand and substantiated, I was referring earlier to greenwashing. Today, uh, consumers are really looking after robust substantiation of the claims, of such uh, kind of claims. And so uh, it creates opportunity within the industry to see growing small brands, little by little growing as brands of products that are actually uh, virtual product, like uh, really supporting the three principles of the Convention of the Biological Diversity. 
And those brands uh, are profitable companies. They are not uh, uh, business models made uh, or created uh, on the, the, I would say, the, the old fashioned uh, business models. But there are business models uh, that are uh, profitable and, and simply uh, producing uh, finished goods that correspond to the, the, um, the growing demands of uh, good and, and, and good for, for you and good for the planet, uh, basically in a very uh, short mar marketing uh, slogan. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Veronique. Uh, uh, we have another question on the chat as well uh, from uh, Shaime. Um, I think I lost the uh, question directly, please. I cannot find it on the chat. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the uh, first is about the, bi uh, the uh, biological pyramid, which is interdependent. So how can we preserve the interdependence uh, of it, uh, of uh, this biological uh, pyramid without uh, prejudice or any injustice to the ecosystem? Another thing is that uh, some companies uh, are using uh, uh, products uh, uh, from biodiversity, uh, people maybe some people are against it, but still they are doing it. So how can we find alternatives uh, to the inputs of production uh, of cosmetics or other things? Um, people are using insects or others uh, without causing any problem to the ecosystems or the bi biological pyramid, as referred to by the speaker. Okay. Did you? Yes. Yes, for the, the first one. The second one, I'm not sure, but I will, I will try. Well, uh, that's one of the, the key points of uh, implementing the biotread principles and criteria, and to have uh, those uh, being communicated uh, throughout uh, a value chain from the primary processors down to the brands, the, the, the final consumers. Because um, when you build a value chain, the first, at the first stage, uh, uh, you need to combine, the, uh, to combine a number of skills, of expertise. Um, and uh, one of the, or few of the skills are uh, ethnobotanists, um, uh, ecologists, uh, researchers, and uh, in uh, developing countries, uh, you, you have uh, lots of very uh, skilled and talented uh, experts, uh, uh, particularly in those areas. And uh, those combined skills uh, allow to create a proper and reliable uh, resource management plan, plans. And uh, those uh, plans ensure uh, that not only uh, you don't create a prejudice to the local ecosystem um, or to the resource itself, but also to the local ecosystem. So it's not just a word, it's really lots of expertise and research before. Um, that's the first uh, point uh, to, to, to rely on. Uh, so again, uh, the biotread principles and criteria are not just a, a marketing tool, it's, uh, uh, it's much more than that. And it's uh, actually first a, a scientific uh, tool. Um, then the, for, for your second question, um, alternative to, to, to respect the ecosystem. So if I understood right uh, your question, um, 
today we know in the industry uh, we have uh, some big commodities that are used at a very 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 large scales and the, the demand is increasing and will continue to increase uh, because the population increase and because the price is low so for companies uh, producing Finnish goods it's interesting because it creates low cost formulas etc etc um, what we try to do through uh, uh, really pushing uh, outreaching um, committing uh, to those principles by trade principles and criteria it's to uh, uh, little by little uh, put the emphasis on uh, a more biodiverse way of interacting with biodiversity for our own needs. Uh, to give you an example, um, one of our fundamental needs uh, is to eat. Uh, so instead of uh, all eating the same things, uh, what is interesting is to look at what exists today in nature, which is not yet valorized uh, as a food product, and to do the proper research to actually uh, add uh, uh, this new resource, for example, uh, as a food. Uh, that's one example. Another example could be uh, we know like plastic uh, create uh, tremendous uh, damages uh, in terms of pollution uh, across the planet. Um, there has been some initiatives recently to develop um, biopolymers uh, that could replace plastics uh, that are uh, much more eco-friendly uh, than plastics. And that also allow to valorize some uh, byproduct uh, from the food industry, for example, which were not valorized before. So we create a more uh, reasonable and circular economy. And uh, this also allows in many ways to better respect uh, the ecosystem, to really fully valorize a resource when we use it. Uh, and also to consider replacing by more natural product some um, substances like plastics that are uh, damaging the ecosystem. So I don't know if I answered uh, right to, to your question, but this is what inspired me, uh, your question. Thank you so much, Veronique. One last question, uh, Veronique, from Iman. Uh, Iman, please, uh, could you please uh, ask your question directly? This is the last question. Well, uh, so again, you are you are saying that uh, we need to find uh, some alternatives. But uh, for example, people are use uh, some companies are using some insects uh, uh, for uh, some products as inputs of uh, the products and they, they will continue using this and with the passage of time the biodiversity would be lost so what is the solution in this case um, because they will continue using it so what can we do about this oh. uh, did you get the question or you need me to well, repeat it I, can repeat I, I, get, it if you want. I get the question. It's alternative to insect. Yes, uh, some of the inputs of uh, for industry are already biodiversity components, uh, and they are so these companies are not respecting ecology. So what's being said here is that uh, uh, these uh, companies are you are using real living organisms or insects. For example, cosmetics are using insects to produce a product, and there is no regulatory uh, framework that's enforced on them and they will continue doing this until causing a problem so we need to know how to regulate this what to prevent a, how to prevent a company from doing this and if they ask us what is the alternative i use insects because it's the only thing i want what are the alternatives then if you want me to stop using insects for uh, biodiversity how can we respond to that Okay, so um, I, I don't have a generic answer to this, but uh, if I uh, look at what type of insect derived ingredients we can find in the cosmetic industry, 
for each case, uh, you, you have a different scenario. For an ingredient that actually used the, the, the insect itself to, to kill it and to smash it, uh, one of the solutions is really to invest in research to look after uh, new uh, resource like a, a plant, uh, vegetable resource, uh, that could uh, create an ingredient that would replace what was interesting in the insect. And uh, for example, uh, in the color cosmetics uh, or in the, the, the wax industry, um, you can already find some alternates uh, that replace the use of insects. And uh, a way to force uh, companies that are continuing doing this is to little by little uh, decrease the, the, the market opportunities to create consumer products made from those ingredients. So I go back to the importance of consumers and the education consumers need to have to understand what is, uh, what is made uh, to produce what they buy. And once a consumer understand that uh, one product contains uh, a piece of an insect and, and this ingredient may generate a uh, uh, problem uh, in terms of uh, sustainability for, for this uh, resource, uh, today, with the, 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 the consci conscience of the consumer, uh, you, you don't find many consumers accepting to continue buying this type of ingredients. So that's one thing. The other thing I can think of is, uh, for example, beeswax. Beeswax, uh, we see a dramatic decrease of bees across the planet because of uh, use of pesticides. Uh, that, that's really a, a problem, definitely. Uh, it's not a simple solution. And uh, I would say that at first for this type of issues, uh, it must come from uh, the political will and from uh, Mr. Dominique, we have lost you. I think we lost Veronique. Veronique, you still there? Can you hear me? She's disconnected. She is not, she is no longer here. Shame at says. Sorry, man, you had a question. I'm very sorry. Okay. I'll say to you, until the speaker returns, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, asking if she can just um, say loud her question until Dominique is back and Russia is asking her uh, to just type it uh, okay. uh, through the chat window. If she is not here uh, back in two minutes, we will have to go to the next uh, expert because uh, yes ah, she's back Never, uh, one second she's back she's back mm -hmm. miss dominique can you get the voice of the interpreter 
Is really kindly confirm if you can get the voice of the interpreter. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, my connection may okay. not be no problem. very good. No problem. No problem. On the, on okay, the, we, we, we have a, a example, last question uh, on the man. Uh, there are. Uh, it is possible uh, to ma answer a, a, a last mm -hmm. question, Veronique. The last According question would be raised now. Is it possible? Would you get the voice? Uh, now, are you getting clearly the voice of the interpreter? Ms. Dominique, can you get our voice clearly? Yes. Yes, now we can. So, will you be able to take another question now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Very quickly, please. Okay. Yeah, very quickly, but I don't know if you've heard uh, already the two examples I have. Uh, we have heard the, uh, the and BWAX. Uh, you said uh, one, uh, the cosmetic example? Mm -hmm. No. The cosmetic uh, example, right? Yeah, yes, uh, about the, the colorant and about the, the beeswax or the bees issues. And I was uh, starting a third example about the, the silk production. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so. And, and for the, the third uh, example, uh, for the, the silk production, um, uh, there are some research in the industry to uh, the, uh, um, ingredients uh, uh, by using other means that are not using uh, insect actually to, uh, to, to, to claim uh, I think there is another problem. We have lost her again. Maybe we, we could stop now. It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She she has a big problem for with connection. We, we sorry. Have to avoid. Uh, Veronique is back. She is I online, am, but I, I'm uh, here. Um, your line has broken. Sorry, I cannot, I don't know if you hear okay. me. <laughs> yes, yes, we can hear you. Just right now, we can hear you. Okay, I, I, I believe, I hope, uh, I hope I have answered to um, uh, Iman's question. No, I didn't ask the question. Actually, it, it was Shaima's question, and Shaima says that thank you so much. You had given me several examples. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Veronique. You have answered uh, uh, Shaima. Uh, we have stop, uh, to stop uh, now because we're running out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique. I'm sorry, Iman. Uh, you can send your question directly to Veronique uh, via uh, the email. I'm sorry for that. Because we are running off time and we have to go uh, to the next speaker uh, in this session, uh, Kemani uh, Godard. She's uh, an experienced uh, intellectual property uh, law and policy advisor. And uh, uh, she continues to maintain a consulting relationship with uh, WIPO. And uh, she has had the senior policy advisor role with the International Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers. So uh, uh, you are online uh, right now, Kimani. You can uh, begin your uh, uh, session, your intervention. Okay, yes, I'm online. Um, uh, yes, please. I... Thank you for being with us today. You can begin. Um, uh, my pleasure. 
I was just um, to ask uh, Julien um, uh, to assist me with the, the slide. Um, I, I have a bit of a presentation. Um, I hope it's not too technical. Um, okay. Uh, did you did you send already uh, uh, your presentation to Julien? Yes, I, yes. I have it. <laughs> Yes. Ah, I uh, yes. name you course, Kimani. You can share your screen on the use your slide, or if you want, I can uh, do it for you. Um, okay, let, let, just let me see if I can share my slides. Um, um, I can do it, no problem. <laughs> Yes, can you do okay, it? Can you do go. Do you have it up now? Voilà. Perfect. Um, yes. Okay, here we go. Um, yes. Uh, yes, so, we have it now. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Kimani Goddard. I'm an intellectual property expert, and I'm also a research fellow in intellectual property uh, uh, law and trade uh, law. Now, some of the issues I noted that uh, when we discuss biodiversity and we discuss products in trade uh, made from biodiversity, we always uh, uh, look more toward the idea that um, we should be concentrated only on the products themselves, the products for trade, the products that are being traded. Um, the previous speaker spoke about uh, some uh, cosmetic products and so on, and, and being concerned about the use of certain kinds of chemicals in those products that come from the environment. So my, uh, my focus is more on the intellectual property side for, for the African continent from north to south. Um, my focus is on, that, on the issue that the genetic resources, biodiversity and traditional knowledge of African communities should be um, be captured within intellectual property that belongs to those communities and those governments, and not um, to a myriad of outside uh, economic uh, entities and forces as is taking place on the continent on the continent at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll, we're going to discuss a little bit about biodiversity and traditional uh, genetic resources and look at uh, it within the context of IP innovation systems. We'll look a little bit about global IP regulation that deals with traditional genetic resources and a little bit of what, um, what opportunities lie within the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement for addressing uh, intellectual property issues and innovation issues with biodiversity. We'll also look at the pattern performance of leading economies globally. And then we'll look at some uh, African countries and their performance uh, in patterns and uh, disaggregate and ex uh, explain this a little bit and why uh, the AFCFTA is a serious opportunity to uh, valorize both traditional knowledge and genetic resources on the African continent for Africans across the continent. So, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, appropriation of genetic resources and um, bio biological knowledge IP stores or databases uh, that can be um, uh, a counteract, that can counteract some of this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, <laughs> I didn't have my camera on. Um, so uh, what you see is that um, you have uh, biodiversity uh, innovation on the Afri African continent, and quite a bit of the biodiversity on this planet is um, uh, between two countries, um, two regions, sorry, uh, the uh, Americas region and uh, the African and the African region. So discussions, many of the discussions when we speak about uh, genetic resources, intellectual property, traditional knowledge, they center on the African uh, continent and they center on resources uh, within the African continent. So Egypt, like many of the other uh, African countries have so far 
uh, ratified a number of conventions, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity, on um, plant varieties and so on. And they have to do with uh, traditional knowledge, uh, the traditional, the ecosystem and biodiversity and genetic resources available in those regions. But one of the problems that you do have is most of the uh, traditional knowledge, is, knowledge about those genetic resources, about, those, um, about this biodiversity, about the ecosystems are being captured in a multinational research and innovation uh, research and in innovation proprietary, intangible proprietary systems that exist outside the African continent. And this is a problematic if we're going to start talking about biotrade as part of uh, the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, because having trade in itself, uh, having trade in products and services in themselves do not guarantee uh, economic development or uh, decent work and uh, decent livelihoods for people. Uh, most, as in most economies across the planet, uh, economic growth uh, is based on uh, some sort of stability and some sort of property ownership, some type of proprietary right. It doesn't have to be property in the traditional sense, but there must be some type of property component that the components and inputs within the products and services that you are producing, that you have some kind of proprietary control over them. So if African economies, despite all of ge their genetic resources are depending on innovation and knowledge systems uh, from outside the continent uh, to valorize uh, these genetic resources, to extract the knowledge and information from these resources, and then the information and knowledge extracted from these resources are being propertized outside the continent and being um, arrogated to entities outside the continent, then the idea of biotrade um, as a source of uh, economic development um, uh, does not hold water, and we can see that uh, with um, uh, the current uh, discussions on the IP waiver that is going on uh, uh, within the with it, uh, with, in relation to COVID nineteen within the um, uh, uh, within the WTO. Uh, next slide, please. So the the COVID nineteen and as I, as I said, you can see this where uh, where the COVID nineteen IP waiver is concerned. So there are many biological products, many medicinal products that depend quite a bit on uh, components and information and knowledge that are sourced from uh, many uh, developing countries, including countries on the African continent. Yet uh, you often have transfer of tech problems, transfer of technology problems. Uh, when you're trying to deal with issues of a pandemic, as we are seeing now, or issues of um, affordable access to medicines, or af affordable access to knowledge and training, in, in the case of copyright, uh, in those same technologies in order to re reproduce these technologies uh, on the continent. So um, India and South Africa recently uh, have, um, in, in 2020, uh, 20, uh, put forward this IP waiver. It is a controversial IP waiver, but it focuses and it centers uh, the, the discussion about biodiversity, traditional knowledge, genetic resources on this transfer of tech issue and on the issue uh, of the fact that much of the sci many scientific discoveries are based on genetic resources that are sourced within developing countries, including countries on the African continent. And uh, only those uh, multinationals who are able to uh, get for themselves uh, IP rights, exclusive rights, patents, copyrights, uh, database rights, et cetera, are able uh, to uh, acquire benefits. And many countries find themselves uh, having access uh, to me medicines, food, and, and agricultural products uh, on the on this uh, basis. So though I um, so in this vein, I, uh, many African economies have been pushing uh, for the implementation of Article sixty six point two of uh, the TRICS Agreement, which is a difficult article uh, to implement because it is very vague as it does it is not uh, drafted in the style of um, an obligation, but it is drafted in the style. 
uh, of best efforts. You also have an issue where individual African countries are signing international investment agreements that contain with many uh, advanced uh, uh, economies that deal in IP. And these often contain very um, um, advanced and very extensive provisions on intellectual property and technology transfer that often interfere uh, with uh, African countries and many other, other developing countries making uh, use of technology transfer. And it may also in certain cases uh, facilitate uh, appropriation of genetic resources and traditional cultural knowledge, particularly in uh, medical and agricultural research fields. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so, okay, we'll, we'll just go forward. So um, just now considering the recent, Okay, <laughs> all right, so we'll, we'll go. For, so we've discussed a little bit uh, bio trade and uh, the recent report from UNCTAD and uh, discussing the implications of bio trade uh, for the collection and production of uh, uh, biological goods and services and how this can be dealt with uh, in the uh, African Free Trade Agreement, how the African Free Trade Agreement is an opportunity uh, for African countries to do what was not possible um, during the TRIPS agreement in 1994, to make for uh, the continent a uh, working uh, intellectual property system that valorizes the knowledge and genetic resources of their traditional communities and centers the ownership of uh, rights in this knowledge within the continent for both the communities that they come from and the governments that manage uh, these communities. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a little idea of how the contrast between the patent applications and um, patent performance between uh, several African economies and the leading economies. So you have um, uh, China, which is now at uh, the top with more than 3 million uh, patents. Now, um, I'm not disaggregating which of these are related to genetic resources and biological resources, but 84% um, of uh, patent filings in 2019 uh, came from China. Now, this the source of these statistics um, are the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the next um, uh, innovative countries include uh, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Switzerland is uh, often on that list as well. So if China is at 3 million, the US is also in the millions, and many of the top performing countries are also in the millions. And so we can uh, have an idea of how, ma how many patents are being, how many innovations are being registered, and we might have a vague idea of the percentage of that that is um, patterns that are related to genetic, where those genetic resources are coming from. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, if we look at the Global Innovation Report uh, from uh, from WIPO in 2020, we'll see that uh, the top three uh, economies, innovative economies were in sub-Saharan Africa, were considered to be South Africa and Mauritius, then Kenya, then R Republic of Tanzania. And in the low income group, you had the Republic of Tanzania and Rwanda uh, coming uh, first. And then um, coming first and, and Rwanda coming second. And then you have Nepal, which is not a, obviously an African country, it's in Asia. But these are the developing nations and um, the LDC nations. And this is their performance in their category, not overall. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now to understand what the figures we're seeing, um, can can we go back to the Nigeria slide, please? So to understand the kinds of figures we are seeing, um, we I I'm, I picked out three high-performing African countries, high-performing African economies, 
all right? Not necessarily in intellectual property, but high performing in terms of their, the GDP of their economies. Uh, so you can understand the comparison. And if you look at Ni uh, Nigeria, you will see um, the patents overall uh, filed. Um, in 2019, you will see that there were only 452. This is a country of over three, um, almost 300 million uh, people with a very large economy based on petroleum and with a lot, um, uh, quite a bit of engineering um, activities taking place in that economy as well. And this is, it, this is, the, the, this is the output. And then you have, in 20, and then you have the, the application stand at 439 and the actual, um, the actual patents granted 252. So within a country of uh, almost 300 million people, you've got, uh, 252 patents granted. Now you can do the disaggregation and figure out how many, what percentage of this, these patents are based on genetic resources and traditional knowledge that we know is in abundance within those um, economies. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So then we have Egypt, we have a little better performance in Egypt, we have 2019, we have filings of a little over a thousand, right? And then we have, um, we have uh, applications of uh, uh, just a little over a thousand, 1027, and we have um, grants of patents of only 160. So out of 100, 1000, over 1000 patents filed, you have 160. Uh, patents granted overall. And this, these are in very large economies that are doing relatively well if you compare them with their neighbors uh, on the African continent. Next slide, please. Then you have South Africa, which, which is often touted as uh, doing the best in this area in terms of patent filings, both general patent filings, as well as genetic resource uh, patent filings. Um, there is a, a, a very extensive health research um, um, uh, drive in, in South Africa. So you've got oh, uh, 1,500 patents filed. You've got out of these 1,500 patents filed, you have in 2019, you have only 567 that have made it uh, to the stage of applications. And then you have um, a little over 600, um, over 600 patents actually um, granted. Obviously, these are these roll over. Sometimes the patent numbers roll over. So you have um, South Africa with a significant um, uh, number of patents, and these are the highest performing countries, even by or with respect to their economies in South Africa. Now, if you in Africa, the African continent, now if you compare this, right? Uh, with uh, the performance of China, South Korea, and so on, and even some of the smaller economies in Europe, you will realize there is a problem. There is a problem, and that problem is not for lack of knowledge of genetic resources. That problem is not for lack of knowledge of uh, traditional um, um, traditional scientific knowledge, traditional innovation, but there seems to be a difficulty in capturing that traditional and scientific, not traditional scientific knowledge about ecosystems and about biodiversity. There is a difficulty for um, African companies, African research institutions, and African uh, universities in capturing that knowledge within the, the proprietary system and arrogating that knowledge to themselves as property rights, not only for the governments themselves, but for the communities, the indigenous communities where this knowledge comes from. Next slide, please.
So you, I just wanted to give you one, one example of this. There are lots of examples of this, and I'm sure there are many people here know this example. And so this is uh, an example of a German uh, pharmaceutical company called Sch uh, Schwab that did some research within South Africa and discovered um, a geranium that had been used among um, the indigenous, indigenous community um, um, for uh, coughs for different uh, for different types of respiratory problems and it was known among these indigenous groups to have antimicrobial and expectorant properties all right so they went looked at this knowledge got this knowledge from the traditional community of course did the the scientific research on these chemicals within the, this plant and were able to extract obviously the chemical precursors that allow um, that uh, give the effect that was needed. And then they created a medicinal product based on that, which they filed patents for and received patents from the EPO. But of course, um, uh, luckily, the, um, luckily uh, you had some act activism within South Africa that was able to get those patents uh, withdrawn and revoked by the, the European or and invalidated by the European patent authorities. So the idea is that this type of knowledge that exists within the African continent, and this is only one example, um, among many uh, uh, communities can be brought within a proprietary system on the African continent that the AFCFTA gives uh, a potential basis, a potential basis to address and to do it in a way that is ethical and that respects the rights of uh, the traditional knowledge of these communities and also creates intellectual property rights that sit within the continent that uh, can then be used in the same way that other leading economies use uh, their intellectual property rights within trade and the global economy. Next slide, please. So, so how do we do this? Um, so some of the policy um, uh, issues that are being considered um, are biological knowledge stores. So this is, is one that um, I'm working on and I'm, I'm doing a paper on that on um, databases. So we are, um, so the idea would based on the AFCFDA to invest in a continent wide research and innovation to produce a biological data store of traditional and genetic resources so that these things are cataloged and they are known and that when um, companies or um, entities on the outside of the continent try um, to patent things that are uh, clearly not their, their knowledge, these are the, the prior art information, the prior knowledge is available, right? And this can, these patents can easily be um, invalidated or can easily be challenged. Also, this can act as a base of knowledge for uh, biological researchers on the continent to develop, develop products. So, and bio trade, as we've been talking about under the AFCFTA must be supported, as I said, by ownership of the IP that forms the basis of that bio-trade, the products and services that are being traded in this bio-trade. If a significant portion of the products that uh, are being produced on the continent are dependent, uh, the value of the products traded are dependent on licensing uh, knowledge that comes from outside of the continent, licensing proprietary rights and intellectual property that comes from outside the continent, then a significant proportion of the revenues gained from bio trade will leave the continent again. And so even if you have trade figures that say your economy is doing well, uh, your payments in licenses um, may result in the fact that the actual net effect of, uh, of bio trade is, is negligible and, and not as uh, strong an impact as you would have liked. Um, do I have a, a next slide? I think I have a next slide. <laughs> this is the last slide, I think. <laughs> it should be 12 slides, okay. 
So yes, so on the basis, I know um, we, we speak often about uh, genetic resources and uh, uh, biological trade and so on in, in the language of uh, common heritage, global commons and so on. But um, maybe it might, it might not be the most popular thing to say, but we need to think about it uh, especially within the context of the African continent and the AFCFTA and developing African innovation systems, it needs to be considered within the context of proprietary rights, intangible uh, property and knowledge um, as property. However, what knowledge at pro as property looks like uh, on the African continent and within uh, the AFCFTA can be transformed into something that is more ethical, that shares the benefits uh, of knowledge more equitably uh, within traditional cultural um, uh, communities and that balances uh, the, the IP rights that uh, African multinationals and companies may acquire with um, rights that are also uh, given to residual rights, exclusive rights for revenues that are also uh, given to the communities from where this knowledge comes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kimani, for your presentation. And uh, uh, now we uh, have a, a, a question from uh, uh, Iman. Please ask your question directly, Iman. Mas uh, good afternoon. I wanted to know more information about the natural medicines. I'd like to know uh, uh, the number of patents. Uh, applied uh, on uh, natural medicines and are they accredited uh, uh, in uh, the field of pharmaceutical industries? So are these patents uh, accredited or not? We have the English translation. Uh, yes, there is English translation. Uh, just try to uh, to oh, I, I, the, uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't have the, sorry about that. I didn't have the English the translation. To, to choose the canon. Yeah, no, it's okay. Choose the uh, English. We have simultaneous uh, interpreting. Yes, I've chosen, I've chosen English. Okay, she should repeat the question so yeah. that I can translate it in English. Could I repeat my question? Yes, sorry. please, Iman. Um, so I'd like to know more information about the natural medicines, the number of patents applied to have patent about the natural medicines. Is it progressing or it can be accredited in the future or on the long term as a competent for the drugs that we are using now? The companies do they deal with these patents and can we collaborate from a trusting perspective or not so um i i wouldn't be able to give you precise statistics on this because what is what needs to be understood is that as you can see from the the patent filings of the um the leading economies there are millions of patents um, and these are only the figures that are coming out of the World Intellectual Property Organizations. Organization. So you have the CNIPA, which is a Chinese patent office, and you have also the USPTO, and you have the EPO. So you, the, these figures, you have overlaps. And the patent figures are include engineer, figures for engineering and uh, all sorts of other things, just not only uh, genetic resources and medicines and biological resources. So biological resources as a percentage of this, this is a very, um, biotech is a very important uh, industry that is growing rapidly, right? And lots of investments in the last year, especially for, um, as, a, as a result of COVID-19 have been made. Uh, however, what we do see is that the vast majority of research being conducted in this area is being conducted in the United States, Europe uh, and China, right? And the resources they, they are using, uh, chemical resources are coming, usually coming from uh, developing nations, both on the African continent, uh, in South America, 
South America and the Caribbean, where I'm originally from, and as well as Southeast Asia. So uh, they are accessing genetic resources and uh, traditional knowledge. And uh, the current system of patent filing does not make it possible for you to know um, the sources of the, the chemicals and plant material that is being used and where the knowledge is coming from. And so the Convention on Biological Diversity aim to do this, but the Convention on Biological Diversity does not have the kind of teeth that the TRIPS agreement uh, has. And so I would say that uh, the AFCFTA on the continent has an opportunity to put in place a Pan-African intellectual property system that valorizes and that makes it mandatory, a disclosure mandatory, not only disclosure, but that makes exclusive rights for use of uh, genetic resources and biological uh, uh, information and traditional knowledge from uh, indigenous communities uh, mandatory. And as I said, what I, I proposed at the end, in order to counteract that, because we don't have the data, it, does, it doesn't exist. Um, to counteract that, um, the, under the African Free Trade Agreement, a pan-African uh, genetic bio, bio store of information, the, the, the genetic knowledge of traditional communities about uh, plants, animals and resources within their environment and uh, uh, putting the research uh, resources of African uh, research institutes and universities to work in order to test and um, test these types, test these um, uh, knowledges scientifically that um, um, traditional communities have in order to catalog uh, this information so that it can be used for innovation on the African continent itself and as well to fend off uh, illegitimate patents that are being filed with uh, African traditional knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Kinan. You have uh, two uh, uh, last questions uh, on the chat, so I will uh, uh, tell you now. And the translation will uh, uh, translate them to you. Uh, the first one from Ahmed. Is the environment incorporating the environmental dimensions? Uh, uh, is it something that really attracts investments or vice versa? This is the first question. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. So it does. In I, I, I would say that it does, but there are caveats. Um, um, investment in environmental innovation and so on um, can often be uh, more arduous, can often entail more costs for investors, uh, right? So they may not be the first, um, not because the ideas are not good or not because the ideas are not viable, but the costs associated with bringing the ideas to market may make it difficult uh, in the current economic system that we have, how it works, yeah, that make it, may make it difficult to bring to market. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. China. We have said that Egypt has submitted 1,000 patents. Only Egypt got 160. Kindly clarify to us, to us why this is happening, the gap between the applications and the already uh, granted patents. Okay, this gap is simply to do with when you file a patent, there are many things, many, uh, many things that can um, interfere with you actually receiving the patent. One of them is prior art. I spoke about prior art and that uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge uh, should be seen as prior art. This is one of the things. So if it exists as a prior art, you may not file a patent on that basis. It may be rejected or there may be competing patents from other companies that have been filed um, in this area. And the, um, the innovation that you are proposing are, is not um, appreciably different from what has already been uh, filed. 
or simply that uh, the, the patent does not have enough uh, scientific data to substantiate um, the claims that it's making, right? So there are many, many, many reasons why um, a patent may be uh, rejected or may not uh, granted. And uh, one of the things that this indicates is that um, that is probably uh, for the Egyptian Patent Office and, and research and scientific organizations to examine the patents that are, have been filed, the technology um, of the patents that are being filed and why these uh, patents are being rejected and use that kind of analysis of that data as um, the basis for creating a policy, a scientific and innovation policy for genetic resources for investing uh, more money in uh, quality um, scientific research and training um, uh, for uh, for Egyptian scientists. The Lada Al Muktama Al Almey Al Misri Lehusul Amazidi member of the Ikhtara. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Uh, um, Kimani, for, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and hope to see you again in uh, other uh, workshops. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.